the Westport River is an estuary. An estuary is a partially enclosed coastal body of brackish water with one or more rivers or streams flowing into it and with a free connection to the open sea. Estuaries form a transition zone between river environments and marine environments. Estuaries are a home to unique plant and animal communities that have adapted to brackish water. Estuaries are some of the most productive ecosystems in the world. Many animals rely on estuaries for food, places to breed, and migration stopovers. An important part of a healthy estuarine ecosystem are salt marshes. For a long time, salt marshes and tidal areas were considered unproductive land and were filled in. But today, they are among the most highly protected wetland types in Massachusetts and have stringent protections. They are recognized as an important resource that provides wildlife habitat, produces large quantities of plant and animal biomass, exports food to nearby coastal food webs, protects the coastal zone from floods, and absorbs some waterborne contaminants. Salt marshes add greatly to the beauty of the coastal landscape, providing a source of recreational enjoyment through fishing, shellfishing, waterfowling, and nature appreciation in all seasons. Salt marshes are a mosaic of snaking channels called tidal creeks that fill with seawater during high tides and drain during low tides. Salt marshes also protect shorelines from erosion by buffering wave action and trapping sediments. They reduce flooding by slowing and absorbing rainwater and protect water quality by filtering runoff and metabolizing excess nutrients. Salt marshes are typically located in intertidal areas behind barrier beaches, bordering quiet water or along the banks of tidal rivers. There are significant salt marsh areas located in Dartmouth, Wareham, Westport, and Fairhaven. Salt marshes can be an extremely difficult place to live because of wide daily fluctuations in salinity, water levels, temperature, and oxygen. Few plants have evolved adaptations to cope with the extreme conditions of the marsh. Plant zonation in a salt marsh results from species-specific adaptations to physical and chemical conditions. Looking out on a healthy salt marsh in full summer growth, you can observe distinct zones of plant growth. Bands of tall grasses inhabit the saturated banks of creeks and coves, and this zone is bordered by a flat meadow of grasses and sedges that may extend landward for great distances before transitioning into upland habitats where there is a greater diversity of shrubs, flowering plants, and grasses. Salt marshes are covered with salt-tolerant plants, or halophytes. Plants like salt hay, black needle rush, and smooth cordgrass thrive. However, these plants do not grow all together in the same area. Marshes are divided into distinct zones, the high marsh and the low marsh. The difference in elevation between these two areas is only just a few centimeters, but for the plants that inhabit each of these zones, a few centimeters makes a world of difference. The low marsh floods daily at high tide. The high marsh usually floods about twice a month during very high tides associated with new and full moons. The more often an area is flooded, the more saline it is. Plants living in salt marshes have different tolerances to salt. Those with higher tolerances are found in the low marsh, and those with lower tolerances to salt are found in the high marsh. The low marsh is located along the water side edge of the salt marsh. It is usually flooded at every tide and exposed during the low tide. It tends to occur as a narrow band along creeks and ditches, whereas the high marsh is more expansive and is flooded less frequently. The predominant plant species found in the low marsh 
is the tall form of smooth cord grass, which is also called Spartina alterniflora. This species can reach a height of six feet and is very tolerant of daily flooding and exposure. The high marsh lies between the low marsh and the marsh's upland border. It can be very expansive in some areas, sometimes extending hundreds of yards inland from the low marsh areas. Soils in the high marsh are mostly saturated and the high marsh is generally flooded only during the higher than average high tides. The dominant species that occur in this area are grasses and rushes like salt hay grass, which is also called Spartina patens, spike grass called Disticlus spicata, black grass called Juncus gerardi, and the short form of Spartina alterniflora. Other plant species commonly found in the high marsh are perennial salt marsh aster and sea lavender. The marsh border is located at the salt marsh's upland edge and other isolated areas on the marsh where elevations are slightly above the high marsh. The marsh border is usually only flooded at extreme astronomical tides and under irregular conditions like storm surges or wind-driven tidal inundations. The upland border does not experience waterlogged conditions or severe salt stress like the other zones. A high diversity of herbs, shrubs, and even trees exist in the marsh border. Plants like marsh elder, called Iva frutescens, seaside goldenrod, called Solidago sempervirin, and grasses called Phragmites are just some of the many marsh plants that live in this zone. Why are salt marshes important? Salt marshes provide a wealth of services often called ecosystem services, that make them extremely valuable habitats to conserve. Salt marshes serve as nursery habitats for a variety of marine life, including more than 75% of fishery species. Wading birds feed in these productive habitats, while migratory birds use salt marshes as a stopping point on their roots. Salt marshes serve as a buffer between land and sea, filtering nutrients, runoff, and heavy metals, and even shielding coastal areas from storm surge, floods, and erosion. These transitional ecosystems are also vital in combating climate change by sequestering carbon in our atmosphere. There are many issues affecting salt marshes. Over the last 350 years, New England marshes have been on the receiving end of multiple human activities that have affected both the plants and animals that live there and a range of its ecological functions. In the past, there were direct losses from filling and dredging and more subtle impacts from tidal restrictions due to the building of roads and culverts. There was also extensive ditching for mosquito control done in the 1930s. Sadly, it was not beneficial for mosquito control or for the health of the marshes. In some areas, these trenches continue to alter vegetation patterns and ecological functions of the marsh. Thankfully, marsh loss from those actions are less common since the implementation of the 1972 Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act. However, Significant future challenges and threats remain. Continuing problems like nutrient loading may be accelerating low marsh loss and unquestionably is degrading estuarine water quality. Accelerating relative sea level rise is potentially the most problematic anthropogenic, which means human-driven, factor affecting tidal marsh systems throughout the East Coast. For thousands of years, Westport salt marshes have kept pace with rising sea level by trapping sediments as the marsh is flooded by building peat and getting more elevation. 
as peat accumulates, marsh elevation increases. However, over the past 10 years, we are noticing our lush green marshes are becoming wetter, some converting to mudflats or open water, an indication that the rise in sea level is outpacing the ability of the marsh to accumulate peat. This marsh drowning is a trend likely to continue as the rate of sea level rise is expected to accelerate with climate change. Locally, we are seeing increased marsh edge erosion, possibly driven by one or more stressors. Some areas may be more resilient than others, but the tipping points of marshes are largely unknown. The Westport River Watershed Alliance is working with regulatory agencies, academic institutions, and others to help develop sound tools, frameworks, and policy ideas for increasing marsh resilience in the watershed. We are working together to develop a blueprint for marsh resilience that aims to provide tools, strategies, and guidance on managing our fragile salt marshes at this critical period and into the future.